So with Dyke McCock Smith in San Antonio, help me welcome Dan Stern. Dan. Thank you. I always appreciate the uh, introductions the best, so I've got to hear it twice, so it really makes me feel good now. I'd like to thank Kim, Lynn, and David for inviting me to be here. It's always uh, nice to get away from all those dang lawyers that are in the building where I work and get to get out and see some real people, though I say this all the time when I give a presentation, if you need to get up and go out and do some real work or uh, just get up and stand and stretch out a little bit. I'm a lawyer. I work with lawyers. I'm used to rude behavior. You're not going to bother me. Go ahead. Uh, one thing, too, usually when the lawyer shows up, everybody goes, oh, this is going to be bad news. Dang it. After it's over, and they say, well, I was right. Man, do you ever have any good news? And so the good thing, and I want to thank Lynn for this, after that financial health presentation, and that was a bummer. Hey, anything I got to say is going to sound pretty good after that, right? Which is kind of interesting. Uh, when we think about where we are <clears throat> in the general kind of discussion about employment law, yeah, you know, we, we refer to the current administration and then that other administration and what went on. And so, though it is different and the federal agencies that we're dealing with seem to be calmer and I wouldn't say friendlier, in fact, they were incredibly friendly under the previous administration. And when they hand you to, uh, their findings and penalize you hundreds of thousands of dollars, they'd say thank you and appreciate it and we look forward to the payment. It was like they were doing you a favor or something. So, but we're not seeing, again, that kind of aggressive nature, but that doesn't mean everything is just fine and settled down. In fact, we're seeing some really interesting things at the federal level, like the EEOC has sued one of the federal agencies for discrimination based on uh, claiming that transgenderism is a protected class under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, I'd like to go through the whole history of Title VII to kind of say why that can be a complicated topic but the EEOC is saying that, you know, the government itself has violated the law on this basis. The agency is dependent by the Department of Justice, and they have filed in their response saying that transgenderism is not a protected class under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So we've got two federal agencies who can't even agree about how the law should be interpreted. Because if you look at Title VII, what it says is you can't be discriminated against on the basis of race, religion, gender, national origin, or color. So where does transgenderism and sexual orientation come into it? Don't have time to talk about that. <laughs> the EEOC says it's protected. Department of Justice says it's not. If you have a federal government contract and you're subject to audit by the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, they say that transgenderism, sexual identity, uh, gender identity, and sexual orientation is a protected class. So you have to know where you fit a lot of times on these spectrums to know really how far you have to go, or should you just assume that you should comply with all of them? That's probably a, a good idea. You know, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration still doesn't have a head administrator, so they don't even know who's in charge over there. So if OSHA shows up, good luck. You know, they doubled the fines and almost doubled them again under the previous administration. Now you could say, well, they hadn't been raised in about 15 years. Well, okay, well, why did we wait then just to double them and make it even worse? Very recently, the National Labor Relations Board issued a, a, a determination, a ruling at the highest level. All the board members voted, and they reinstated an employee because that employee got fired for posting on Facebook to, uh, in relation to a conversation that an ex-employee had about possibly suing the company. And the current employee said, dang right, go ahead and do it. Then they fired him, and the National Labor Relations Board put him back to work, said you can't do that. Those kind of discussions are what's called protected concerted activity. I wish we had time to talk about what that means too, but that's an hour long presentation at least. So they put him back to work and the chair of the National Labor Relations Board said that is an absurd result. So we don't know really where the board will head, so we have to be very cautious as we go into that. The Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division, though not supporting the uh, regulations that were about to be implemented on December 1st last year uh, that would have raised the guaranteed salary for the white collar exemptions. They have again withdrawn their support, but they are still talking about possibly raising it some. We just don't know how much. So we're, again, we're in a bit of a flux. And if that doesn't uh, make you feel any better, we'll please be assured that the plaintiff attorneys that are out there are seeing this as a good feeding season for any kind of employment disputes that they can possibly pursue, and they are incredibly active. And when you think about it, too, if you know about constitutional law, you know, there are a lot of state rights 
So there are many states, and if you, have, if you aren't glad to be in the great state of Texas, the great Lone Star State, if you saw what some of the other states were doing with their employment laws, you would get down and kiss the ground of the state of Texas and thank, say, thank goodness I'm still here. Because the other states are just going crazy. And if that isn't enough, talking about the EEOC, let's go back to those guys for just a minute. They have issued some guidance on harassment, proposed guidance, so eventually it'll be put in place. It's not the law, it's just how they look at that. And they have some interesting concepts about harassment. They talk about microaggression being harassment. If you know what microaggression is, you read too much. You're not watching enough television. <laughs> microaggression is doing things like going up to a female in a hospital who has a stethoscope and treating her like she's a nurse when she could be a physician. It's asking an Asian who shows up at your workplace who happens to be bringing in food to have lunch with a friend if he's the delivery guy for the restaurant. What the heck? Is that right? Yes, that's what they say. They also say, and I'll stop on this and then actually get into some substantive material here, the issue about gender identity, they say you don't have to transform from one gender to another to be protected. If you're a male and you identify as a female, you should be treated as a female. And if you continue to call that person who identifies that way he, you are harassing that individual on the basis of gender. Those are the positions that the EEOC is taking. I'll take a drink now, just to let y'all think about that. <laughs> Lock and load, right? Who said that? Okay. Well, let's get to the things that we really can uh, kind of focus on and not guess where these things are going to go. Disability and reasonable accommodation. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in the 1990s, and it's one of the, you know, a law that actually makes a lot of sense because any of us could have a disability, and we could all be subject to discrimination based on preconceived notions uh, and prejudices about individuals with physical and mental limitations. So in some ways, we should all be very glad that there is such a law because it could be us. But when you start looking at how it isn't being interpreted and some of the obligations you have, you have to really be aware and talking about uh, you know, human resources assistance. If you don't have someone in your company, really, if you're 15 employees and above, if you don't have someone in your company who is dedicated at least in part to human resources, there's a trainer coming, okay? So you gotta be ready. Because the Americans with Disabilities Act, though passed in 1990, was then amended later, uh, I forget when it was, so now it's actually the ADAA, and in amending it, they said in the commentary, you shouldn't even worry about if the individual's condition really meets the definition of disability. If they've asked for an accommodation, you should begin the interactive dialogue which in some ways is really just good business anyway. Because if you have an employee you know who's productive, this is the way you kind of default to, and they ask you for something like a screen with a bigger font size or just a bigger one or a filter, you're probably gonna do it because it's a good employee. Without really thinking about, is it necessary? Should I ask their doctor to provide some medical information say they do or not? But the, again, the way the law reads now, if it is brought to your attention, you should begin the interactive dialogue and look at possibly uh, accommodating them. So that some of the issues that you have to look at is, well, what's reasonable? Now, that's one of those terms that makes lots of lawyers rich because you end up in disputes and then there is litigation and you have to go to the courthouse and I hate the courthouse because there's lawyers there and things happen and you get into arguments and billable hours go up and then people get mad at me because I'm trying to defend them. So, you know, it's just something you want to think about. And one of the things that they're really emphasizing at the EEOC as a reasonable accommodation is the provision of leaves of absence. When I started practicing law, and I always hope, kind of hoped I'd never get to, to be like this and use this term, 27 years ago, I've been practicing law for 27 years and I've never seen anything like it. Well, we've never seen anything like it. They're saying a reasonable accommodation is to provide someone a leave of absence. Well, how does that help them do their job? They're not even at work. So I have to let them be away from work to help them do their job? That, it, it doesn't make any sense. But when I started uh, practicing again in 1990, every leave of absence policy we wrote had what we called a hard cap. 
30 days, 60 days, you made it up. You didn't have, there's no guidelines. And if you couldn't come back to work in that amount of time, you were terminated. You have a policy like that right now, even if you don't uh, impose that limitation on anyone, the EEOC that's a, says that's a per se violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay. Now, I just haven't hurt anybody, nobody's been damaged, so what's the remedy? Well, they is they make you change your policy, but if someone has been terminated, there's a good chance that the EEOC may choose to bring that lawsuit, and the, just about the worst uh, lawsuit that you can have is one that's filed against you by the federal government. They got more money than everybody. I shouldn't bring, use religious terms, but a lot of people say they got more gun, money than God. I don't think God needs any money, but uh, that's a you know, euphemism a lot of people use. So you don't want to have to look at your leave of absence policies. And so if you have a limitation, you want to have some guideline, you have to have some caveat to allow it to be extended. And you have to think about how are you going to do that. Now, we'll talk about the Family and Medical Leave Act very, very briefly somewhere in one of these slides. But <clears throat> if you have 50 or more employees, then you have to worry about the Family and Medical Leave. And you may think, well, that's the federal statute. And it says I only need to give them 12 weeks. Why do I have to give them any more? because of the need for a reasonable accommodation. And if you read the EEOC guidance on it, they say that if you have to provide or should provide a leave of absence as a reasonable accommodation, it should be job protected. And you may wonder, well, then why do we need the Family and Medical Leave Act? And I can say, I don't know. Seems to me like what the EEOC is saying, you know, supersedes what the, you know, the FMLA even requires. Need for a request. Does somebody have to say, I need a reasonable accommodation? That's usually the way it starts, but often if you can see and you know, realize that an employee is having a difficulty performing, possibly because of a physical limitation or mental limitation, you should initiate the interactive dialogue. And in some respects, and I'm not supporting anything of these interpretations of these statutes, but a lot of this really could be good business, viewed as good business. Certainly, if it's a good employee, you will always ask, can I help you? What do you need? What kind of assistance? Chairs, whatever it might be, to help you do your job, let's look at it. Particularly as you have people who are sitting out in trucks for hours and hours a day, you are probably constantly looking at technology to make it uh, easier and better and you know, better for their health, talking about uh, you know, health plans and all of that. So that's really kind of what a lot of this is, goes to, but you're gonna have, as Lynn said, that one person who asked for that one thing, and you think, that ain't right. Nobody needs that. So then you have to figure out how you can make that decision, how many questions you want to ask, because you start asking too many medical questions, then the law also protects people who you regard as having a disability. They don't even have to have a medical or mental condition. But if you treat them as if you think they have one, you could possibly violate the law, okay? So at the very end, I'm gonna to get to the end right now because I may not make it through all my slides because I don't want this to go on for 45 minutes, which I have been known to do when I've only had 30 minutes. Uh, you know, don't act in haste and have somebody who has area, you know, expertise in the area. It's not a lot, long conversation. I have a lot of very short phone calls during the week. Just reminding people, think about this, ask these questions, don't ask those questions, and go forward. Now, retaliation. Discrimination, if you look at the law and you read the interpretations, ha supposedly has to be intentional. You have a prejudice, a bias, you have a reason to treat people differently, right? I, I, I mentioned the five protected classes in Title VII. The disability is in another statute, age is in a different statute. But retaliation is in almost all statutes. So that if someone complains about being mistreated, and you take a negative action against them, they have a cause of action for retaliation. So, it kind of seems illogical to hire someone with red hair, which would be a good idea, only to terminate that person because he has red hair. That ain't fair, that ain't fun. Down late, some people do it just to make fun of redheads, so it's kind of like you know, mess, mess around with them a little bit. But it, Again, you hired me with having red hair, you terminated me having red hair. Why, you know, discrimination doesn't make any sense. There are ways it could, but usually it doesn't. But if I had complained during my employment about being mistreated because of my hair color, and then you take action against me, I have a pretty good retaliation claim. 
So you say, well, Dan, what does that mean? I mean, how do I prevent these retaliation suits? <sighs> Evaluations, this has come up a couple of times today. Apparently a lot more people do them than I would have thought. If you do them, you better do them well. If you're not willing to commit to doing them well, I'm not gonna say don't do them, don't do them. Because what we often see is Dan, who's been here 22 years, has gotten great evaluations. He walks on water, as they say. He complains about being discriminated because of his age. His next evaluation is terrible. And you say, Dan, you've never been any good. I just let you slide. I was giving you evaluations, trying to motivate you, trying to make you feel good. But you're terrible. So what does that look like? Looks like retaliation for complaining about age discrimination. Do your evaluations. Put time and effort into them. Be very honest, direct, and make sure that they're clear in what you expect of that employee going forward. Don't hesitate to hurt their feelings. You can be positive in part and negative in part. Right? But you have to make sure that they are, don't look to be bulletproof because they're so great. Broad interpretation. I mean, it, it really looks at any, the person could be complaining about something and you know they don't even believe their complaint. But if there could be some reasonableness to it, that's protected, right? Timing issues. If you do something, an adverse action against someone fairly soon after they bring a complaint to your attention, that could be enough for a jury to find that you engaged in retaliation. Does that mean that you don't discipline an employee who has done something that violated a, a policy right after they complain? Well, if you have consistently enforced that policy, then you enforce it the same way. And that's one of the questions you get asked by any employment lawyer, any HR consultant, HR person in your department, in your company. When you say, I'm going to counsel this, him, and just so you'll know, he complained about harassment, they're going to say, have you counseled anyone else for the same violation? Has anyone else engaged in the same violation? And they'll probably ask it about five different ways, <laughs> because sometimes we want to make sure you're really listening to the question. Are we being consistent? Because if we're not, then it may look retaliatory. Documentation. Darn that documentation. What are the three key words in real estate? Okay, I'll tell you. Location, location, location. <laughs> I've got some uh, real estate and I've always done terrible. Apparently I didn't understand that principle. What are the three key words in uh, employment law and employment relations? Documentation, documentation, documentation. Now doing it, if you don't do it right, then maybe doing it three times is too, you know, it makes it even worse. This whistleblower concept, uh, not to get into that, it's a little bit different because whistleblowers, it, but it is whistleblowers, is usually a specific statutory protection that says if you contact a federal agency, report something, you're protected. What do juries believe? And this is the key, one of the key things. The law is important to know, but you also have to think about people and what people will say and believe. And I don't remember the statistics because I read them a long time ago, so. Uh, but generally, way less than half of the people in, in America believe that a, an employer would intentionally discriminate against someone. That's a pretty shocking number, really. I would never have believed it. But well over 70% of employees believe that employers will retaliate against employees for complaining. So how do you kind of mitigate that a little bit? You're not going to like this. You have to encourage them to complain. You have to tell them. If you don't think you're being treated right, you need to tell me. In fact, you have to tell me. If your coworkers are mistreating you, you have to tell me. And you have to tell them many times that they have to tell you. So if you're ever sitting in a deposition, anybody ever been in a deposition? Was it fun? Heck no, some jerk lawyer trying to make you doubt yourself, and question yourself, and question your memory, and do you know the law? Have you ever been trained on the law? How do you know then how to do what's right under the law if you haven't been trained? Those are the kind of questions you're gonna get. But if you get a deposition, they say, well, how does an employee know they're supposed to complain? Well, I told them about 22 times last year. We had training, we had meetings, we had surveys, I gave them the policy, I highlighted it, and I outlined it, uh, and whatever I could do to make sure they understood that they should complain. Those are the things that juries like to hear. Harassment. Every plaintiff lawyer's dream, pretty much, because there's a, there's a, 
a statement in the law. You know, it's called question of fact. There's a process in a lawsuit that where you could possibly have the case dismissed called summary judgment if there are no questions of fact. Well, in a harassment lawsuit, usually everything that's talked about is a question of fact. Very seldom do the parties agree on things. So what we could uh, possibly get is a, you know, a, there, that there is no question of fact is that we had a policy. It explained to employees how to complain, who to report to, that we, that we were going to investigate and that we were going to take action. That can at least eliminate some of the questions of fact. So why is it still an issue? Just talking to somebody just yesterday about a guy who's our IT guy. Uh, interesting, most people think IT guys are kind of nerdy and you know not very cool, right? But they seem to want to be cool. I'm not saying that's the case. I have a degree in computer information systems, okay? So if you're up there thinking that dude's kind of weird, well, maybe that's what it's all about then, I don't know. But so these guy, this guy, this IT guy was saying, like he sent a, one of his coworkers a text, I'm meeting in a parking lot at HB and said, I'm eating pizza in my car, do you want to come have lunch? LOL. I think that means laugh out loud. I don't know, I don't use those little acronyms. She said, no, I'm gonna get a salad. She went back and said, man, that was kind of weird. That kind of creeped me out. Is that harassment? I don't think it rises to the level of legal harassment. Do you have to address it? Yeah, you gotta look at it, you gotta talk about it. You may have to tell that guy, sorry dude, man, people think you're creepy. No, you don't tell them like that. You talk to him and say, look, <laughs> think about what you're saying, think about how people may, may receive it. You know, it's a lot of hand-holding in, in like of that because that's a, some, all, so often a lack of awareness. What are your actions conveying to other people? And my perception is my reality. Consensual. <sighs> Two people can actually be having a relationship Fully consensual, you know, not unwelcome at all. Something bad happens, it's not consensual anymore. Is it your job as an employer to be a mind reader and know when that happens? Well, you gotta do your best sometimes to figure out that's the case. And if you do management training about harassment, this is uh, a message I would convey to, to people in management. Never date a subordinate. Never, 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 Never date a subordinate, but if you do, never, 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 never break up. <laughs> and if that doesn't feel like a slap in their face and doesn't get the message across, then they're hopeless and you've got other problems. <laughs> uh, and two, a lot of times what you know can happen in, David and I sometimes, and I don't mean to bring David into this, but sometimes we get on the phone and we say some inappropriate things to each other. We're buds, right? We get along, got a long history with each other. Things that some people hear and they go, man, those guys are kind of strange, but you know, that, God, don't, aren't they hurting each other's feelings? Like, no, you know, we get along. And so it's not harassment to us. It's not unwelcome, consensual if you want to call it that. But if he and I are doing it in an open area and there's someone who's a passive listening post, if you want to call it that, they could feel that they are being harassed. An even bigger issue is if management sees people like David and I acting foolishly and don't do anything about it, then that active passive, I'm sorry, passive listener thinks, well, management doesn't care. And so if they get into a situation where they feel like they're being harassed, they're not likely to report it because they don't think you're going to do anything. So, you may think, well, God, the workplace is no fun. Well, you know, my mama used to always say, well, actually, she didn't. Work's not supposed to be fun. Work's work. Actually, she always say, ah, oh, we got to have fun at work. My mother hugged everybody except for us, which is kind of interesting. But we won't get into that. <laughs> German family, we didn't hug each other ever, right? We just didn't. My dad told me he loved me maybe one time. And so when I see other people hugging and stuff, I go, mm, man. And particularly when I see it at work. So what do you do? If you're a hugger, you're a hugger. There ain't nothing wrong with it. My mother lived in an assisted living facility. I would pick her up one day and she walked by every person. She hugged them all. She said, some of them don't like it, but I don't care. <laughs> you get to do that when you're 85, right? That's the fun of being old. But at work, 
you know, if you're a hugger, you sit down with your employees and you say, hey, I'm a hugger. If you don't like it, all you got to do is tell me. I promise you, I won't hug you anymore and I won't hold it against you. Right? Then, of course, you have to remember you told them that, not hug them anymore, but it is important to realize you can have fun at work, but you got to be careful about it. Managerial conduct is the thing that gets you in trouble quicker than anything else. Responsiveness. So I got a great story about how lack of responsiveness got a client that David used to work at in big trouble at one of their facilities. But if you don't respond in some way that gives the person who brought the complaint forward, they think you don't believe them. And so sometimes it means not doing what you really want to do that you call real work. Now, if you have something to do that's so important, you make sure that person understands you'll get back to them as soon as you can, but you have to do this other thing and then make sure you do go back and, and make it happen. Training, again, kind of like telling them what I just, something I kind of beat to death early on here. Uh, who do you train? Do you train management and employees? Yes. You train managers, and you train managers different than employees. You be almost mean sometimes to managers. You engage in this conduct, you will be fired with employees. You should not engage in this conduct. If it happens, you should report it to us. We do want to know. We will respond. We will investigate. But I can't tell you how many times managers, particularly at some entry levels, who've been with their buddies working up through the company, who don't think they're doing anything wrong and they don't appreciate the fact that they could lose their job if they were already stressed about financial health, I had to bring that up again, then they really will be if they realize they might lose their job uh, because of it. Yeah, now what's admissible? This is another interesting concept about harassment, more of a legal issue, but usually with discrimination, what I'd call a traditional discrimination claim, you fire someone because they have red hair, which actually is not discriminatory. Why is it not discriminatory? It's not a protected class. It ain't right, but it's not a protected, protected class. But usually, you know, the evidence is really, you know, built around that action. But with harassment, they can go back years because it could all contribute to or, be admiss or go to the fact of proving that harassment occurred or that responses were not timely implemented. Wage and hour cases. Don't want to spend a whole lot of time about this either because the nuances of the Fair Labor Standards Act, which was passed in the mid-30s, and we continue to still get it wrong almost every single day. In fact, I promise you that every employer in America has at one point violated the Fair Labor Standards Act because it is so nuanced and so difficult to understand and interpret. And looking at the, you know, the different ways that y'all came in the survey about the different ways to pay drivers and that, the more you do, you have these different schemes on how to pay individuals, which sometimes is the only way you can get them and the only way it makes any sense to survive, your chances, your chances, that's not that big of a word, I sure had a problem with it though, your chances of violating the Fair Labor Standards Act go up significantly. So be very cautious and get very good advice when you're implementing new pay plans to make sure that it is uh, viable under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Technical violations. Again, you think you're doing it all, you're right. And I'll tell you, because uh, there's another here somewhere, compensable time technical violations. These two often go together. What is compensable time? The, the statute said that time spent to the benefit or suffered for the benefit of the employer. Suffered, I just love that part. Had a case where the employer told uh, some office staff, you have to be ready to work at exactly 8 o'clock. Exactly 8 o'clock. That doesn't sound like that tough of a rule, does it? That sound like that violates the law? Well, in talking to those employees, they said, well, that means I have to get here by 745. And I don't remember exactly what, what all they said that that, you know, to say to justify that. But the DOL investigator said, you know, I look at it a lot like band practice. This is when you go, man, this is not good. <laughs> band practice, you have to be on the field at eight o'clock. So what else does that entail? Getting there, getting your instrument out of its, you know, out of its carrier, getting it all ready, you know, getting your reed wet on your, on your clarinet and all that kind of stuff and you're out, so there's preparation time. I didn't think it was comparable at all to what these people were being told. But anyway, but w another factor that did get them in trouble was because they felt they had to be there at 745 
to get ready for the 8 o'clock start time, if the phone rang, they would answer it. That immediately becomes compensable time. Then they are suffering, you know, to the benefit of the employer. So you have to think about that. Had a, a, too many war stories, sorry, but this was a real quick one, because these are the kind of things that they don't necessarily add up to very much money per employee, but you, uh, plaintiff lawyers don't care. And the reason why they don't care is if they get to trial and they prevail really to any degree, the award of attorney's fees is automatic. Each individual that may have been adversely affected may not get more than a few hundred dollars, but attorney's fees will easily be over fifty to $75,000. And it could go significantly higher if you have a whole lot more people involved. So again, who's your area knowledge expert to help you get through that? Special problems with technology, your phone, their phone, iPad, laptop, Insta, Instagram, Face, Snap, whatever it was that Bill Belichick said about some of the technology. If you're telling a non-exempt employee, and I'm just going to assume everybody knows what that means, hourly paid employee entitled to overtime, if you give them a, 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 some kind of smart device, a technology device that they carry with them all the time, they look at an email over the weekend, eh, that may not be compensable time. They look at five emails, we're starting to get into compensable time. And so is that very much money out of your pocket if you, if you pay it? No, but if you have a bunch of people, then again, it could end up being interesting enough for a plaintiff attorney to take it. So there's a great case out there that the DOL actually brought on behalf of a class of employees where they had to sit there and wait for their computer to boot up which isn't too big of a deal now with technology. They, they, you know, ramp up pretty quick. But back in the day, when we were just firstly starting to use a lot of this technology, you had to wait a while for your computer to warm up and had to, you know, flash a little bit. Sometimes it wouldn't totally, you know, uh, boot up and you'd have to start over. The DOL said all of that is compensable time. But they couldn't log in to the timekeeping system until the computer started. So you, know, you have to talk about how to correct that in a different, uh, different discussion. Record keeping, uh, so many different ways to do it now. But again, be very cautious and corrections. Off the clock work, as obvious as this sounds, you can't let an employee do volunteer work for you. So if they get there early just because that's the bus schedule, then they have to sit there and wait. They can't start work uh, even though they want to because it's one of the most interesting things about the Fair Labor Standards Act. You may have to fire an employee if you don't want to pay them overtime, you may have to fire them for working too hard. The American way, by gosh. As they get there and they're ready to work and they're going to do some things, but they are a non-exempt employee and you let them do it and you see them do it, you're going to be on the hook for that time. Uh, misclassifications, if you think somebody is an exempt, and again, I'm going to assume you know what that means. If you think you have an exempt employee that you're going to pay a salary to and not pay overtime, you best be right. Best be right. We'll talk about audits at the very end. And who does your payroll? If you do it yourself, well, better, sure, again, be, make sure you know how, you, how it works. Make sure you know what the deductions can be and can't be from exempt employees. If you use someone as an outside party and there's a, a very large provider, an international company, I guess, that I know that a lot of my clients use, and I'll be honest with you, quite frankly, I encourage them not to because I've heard too many stories about them for sure not being proactive about providing advice on how to comply. And at times, even sitting there passively watching while it, they are improperly paying employees with the payroll system. So make sure you got a good one there. Uh, supervisor employee training. Not to spend a whole lot of time on this. You gotta do it. You need to do it. Gotta do it. Let's just say you gotta do it. Uh, because if you don't, you may have that supervisor. It's bad enough if you're sitting in that deposition and they say, what does harassment mean? Well, well, have you had training on harassment? Well, not really, but I mean, I, I've read about it and there was this lawyer at this trucking convention and he acted like he knew a lot about it and he talked about it some. So yeah, I've, I've kind of heard about it. So it's tough enough for you as an owner who really knows, you know, who's got a, a lot of good business uh, sophistication, a lot more confidence, but you've got a frontline supervisor possibly who's sitting in one of those depositions and they start to question him and her and her knowledge and her expertise and her ability to interpret the law. They may actually just fall apart. Anybody ever seen uh, The Blind Side? Yeah. And you know, and, and that mean, mean lady from the NCAA is questioning Big Mike, oh, we're not supposed to call him Big Mike, about why he was going to Ole Miss. 
At one point, he just got up and walked out. See, that could happen to one of your employees at a deposition if they start asking them too hard a question. So we don't want that to happen because it makes the defense lawyer very nervous and kind of might make them nauseous if that happens. Uh, <clears throat> requirements, really not a lot of requirements to do much training, but you can't, you know, you can't rely on that. Common remedy, if you are found, if the EEOC comes after you and some of the other federal agencies too, but particularly the EEOC, if they come after you because they believe you violated uh, Title VII, ADA, ADEA, they almost, and they, you come to a settlement, and the, or even if you go through uh, trial and you lose, one of the most common remedies is they make you do training. So you might as well do it anyway. And if you read the EEOC's guidance on harassment, which if you do, I'll make fun of you because I'll tell you some of the important parts, and that's probably as much as you need to know, is they're saying you have to do training. Now, it's not in the law, but they say you have to. That's one of the great things about being in charge of a federal agency. You can just say things like you have to do it, like your mom used to do that. And you'd say, why? And she would say, because I told you. I love that. Use it on my kids. They didn't care. Anyway, but that's kind of how it is. And the EEOC not only says you have to do training, they're saying you have to do live training because it has to be interactive. You have to have the employees, give the employees an opportunity to ask questions and hear immediate responses. So again, that's what they're talking about. And those are the kind of things too, and I've never had this happen to me, Lord willing, but they tell me that if you get stopped by a uh, law enforcement officer and maybe you smell of alcohol, they will look around in your vehicle and if they see bottle caps or receipts that show that you have purchased alcohol, that is all evidence that could be used against you to show that you were driving under the influence. And so the EEOC will use failure to train as evidence that you allowed a harassment, uh, 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 an environment where harassment could take place. It's very interesting how often you hear employees now use the term hostile work environment. What the heck? Who talks like that? Hostile work environment. I mean, it's a bad place, it's a real bad place, hostile work environment. It's kind of like they all seem to have lawyers. I'm gonna go talk to my lawyer. Go ahead, take your checkbook with you, because it'll cost everybody to go talk to them. Why don't you just get a good dog? That's what I tell them, just get a good dog. You'd be a lot better off than getting a lawyer. Uh, assessing the value, you got, do have to think about it. Do you bring in people if you have overseas, if you have them overseas and some things like that? You got people on the road all over the place. Can you bring them all in? How do you make it effective as possible though? Uh, anyway, and you don't want to admit that you have not done any training. Privacy, we'll fly through this. Right to monitor, make sure that your employees know that you can read their emails, that you can look at the documents they create. Put it in your policy and tell them that they're saying that they consent to it. Somewhere I went too fast. Oh yeah, 5A, I forgot. I said five at the beginning, so I had to go 5A because I ended up with six topics. Uh, company devices, that's pretty good. That's pretty, it's, it's a much simpler analysis you, to look at company devices, but if you start to look at the bring your own device concept in the workplace and you start looking at somebody in employees individually owned iPhone, smart, you know, iPad, all those kind of things, whatever all those devices might be, I just use whatever they give me. Hopefully I can figure it out. But if you start to look further in those kind of, uh, that kind of equipment, you may have a bigger problem. So the policies really need to address this and make sure they know what you will look at. In fact, there's this thing, and I, you know, if you allow them to network, and of course, why would you tell them to bring your own device if you don't let them network into your network or connect to your network? But there's a thing called a kill signal. And that's, you know, it really does exactly what it says. So that if an employee leaves, you can send a kill signal to that phone and it wipes out the phone completely. Laptop, iPad, all those kind of things. And personal stuff, any of it. So that sounds great, but if you don't put them on notice of it and they have some information on there that may be privileged or otherwise proprietary, you know, there may be a problem there. So make sure they know that that's what they're, you're gonna do to it. If you wanna do it, do it to them. Societal sensitivity. You know, you hear a lot of employees say, well, you just violated my constitutional rights, okay? Now, if you don't, don't learn anything else from this presentation that I'm giving today. I want you to remember this, learn this. And there's something else I'm gonna tell you, so let me forget David. It's, it's a, something about Texas, another thing that I want them to learn, okay? That's your job, write it down. <coughs> is, <coughs> when the employee says, you violated my constitutional rights, you tell them, you have no constitutional rights here. Does anybody know what that is? 
you can only violate someone's a person's vi uh, constitutional rights may only be violated if there's government action. You can go to their house, walk in the front door. Now, this could be, you know, uh, burglary and <laughs> that kind of stuff, some criminal issues, and go in there and look around and take things out of their house. It's not a violation of their constitutional rights. Right? Keep that in mind. I mean, you got that kind of power as an employer. Texas is still an at-will state. Dang it. A uh, few legal guidelines, but I say societal sensitivities. People don't like it when you start looking into people's houses, look going too far into their, you know, their personal emails and things like that. So be cautious about that. Very few legal guidelines, constitutional rights talked about. Audio and video, if you want to monitor, you're doing audio and video. Uh, it is interesting that with audio, you can do it without anyone's consent. I'm sorry, said it wrong. You can do video monitoring without anyone's consent. You can just put up a camera and record. You cannot. Uh, record audio unless one person to the conversation consents. So if you leave a recording device in a break room and just let it run, you are committing wire, uh, that's wiretapping under both federal and state law and a big old problem. Social media, do you want to look at social media to find out what your employees are doing? I'm against it. You often find out things you don't want to know. They're trying to organize a union. You may think, well, that's exactly what I want to know. No, you really you want to want to find it out through social media. You want to find out other ways that address it that way. They may be talking about medical conditions, things that you didn't know about, and now you can be charged with that knowledge. Phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. And I bring this up because uh, this happened to a number of employees, and it happens at the beginning of the year, and I think actually BFG sent out an alert on it that and it's remarkable what people can do but they send an email from someone who's like a high official in the company to someone maybe in the hr department payroll department that says send me all the w not to but what's that form anyway send me all the payroll information w-2s listing of employees with with uh, earnings et cetera et cetera uh in the format that we have it in the excel spreadsheet whatever it says and it looks exactly almost like it did come from that official. And people just respond without thinking about it and they send all that information to that Fisher hacker who now can go file fake uh, in income tax returns and get that money back. So you need to do some training on that, which is really not necessarily a privacy issue, but it's a technology issue that is becoming very, very prevalent. Five ways to avoid trouble. Don't ever act in haste. You never have to fire anybody today. You can send them home, you can take them out of the workplace, you can suspend them with or without pay. There's a lot of things you can do, but you don't have to fire someone today. You need to investigate, you need to get all the facts and make sure you know what's going on before you make an important decision. Uh, avoid use of online forms, templates, and generic services. Your company's unique. Your company's different than any other company in the world. So though there is a lot of consistent language that's used throughout these policies, your policies are going to be different than others. And certainly if you're entering into something like an employment agreement with someone, do not use something that you just pulled off of the internet and changed the names. I've seen to get too many people in too much trouble. Don't play lawyer. Lawyers are expensive. I apologize in advance. Don't play lawyer and try to enter into these enforceable agreements that could end up costing you 20 times what a lawyer would have charged you to provide the same service. Build relationships with area knowledgeable experts. Build relationships. Uh, not to complain, but I, I have to say it's one of the challenges I face as I get older and the longer I practice law. Relationships don't seem to mean as much as they did in the past. Costs have a lot to do with it. Technology changing and finding alternatives have a lot to do with it. People that I've done work with, it seems like for my entire career, I hardly ever hear from them anymore. So I don't have the relationship and it's hard for me to keep it. But the relationships you build with these people uh, and you call them to ask you for lunch and you tell them, you better call me next time because if you don't call me and ask me to lunch, I'm finding me a new an area, knowledgeable expert. Build relationships, someone you trust, someone you know who will look out for your well-being too. Utilize independent third-party sources to conduct reviews, audits, and updates to employment documents. Two reasons why. Those people are probably going to know more about it than you do, what they're looking at. I-9s, for example, seems like a very easy document to fill out. People get penalized 
lots and lots of money all the time because they forgot to put the date down, didn't put the right name, forgot their title, very minor technical violations. Have somebody conduct an audit that knows what's going on. And if you use someone outside of your company to conduct that audit, it gives it a tremendous amount of credibility. So even if you don't find, or if something isn't found, it's hard for that whoever's looking at it and saying you did it wrong to say you did it intentionally. Like, what the heck? I hired somebody else to come in to do it to make sure it got done right. I asked them to do it. Get, gather good information, be decisive, and proceed with confidence. Okay? And you can do that now with the constitutional uh, rights issue. And one final thing. And I do this because, <clears throat> in large part, because I had a bankruptcy instructor in law school, and he said, to make an A in this class, you have to teach me one thing that I didn't know. Well, I tried to teach him something about bankruptcy law, and he didn't think that was really all that funny because this was a community property class. I thought it was pretty, pretty creative on my part, but he didn't buy into it. So one other, one other thing that you should leave with today, and I'll ask if anybody knows this, but what is the state dinosaur? I'm not going to charge you extra for this. It is the Paluxy Saurus Jonesy. P-A-W-L-U-X-Y, Jonesy, I don't know how to spell that, Saurus. Paluxy Saurus Jonesy. All right, we're supposed to be on break now. I don't know how long you want to take time, but uh, I know you're all stunned. It's like, wow, a state dinosaur. Man, along with the bird and everything else. I enjoyed being here today. Thanks a lot. If you have any